Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's begin. Um, welcome everyone to tonight's talk. Um, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity every month or so to do a talk on a, on a different topic, which may not commonly be uh, given or presented in, you know, either a retreat um, kind of activity. And even some of these topics are just not addressed so, um, so explicitly in, in a typical Dharma talk, like, you know, on a Buddhist sutra or a popular Buddhist teaching. And for the past couple of, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, for the past <coughs> couple of talks that I've been doing, I've been introducing some of either the work that I've been doing and how it relates to Buddhist practice, or um, talking about some concepts that are popular in um, the counseling field or field of psychotherapy, Western psychology, and addressing it, and then presenting the Buddhist perspective. And that's the approach that I'll take tonight. This topic of depression. Uh, you know, the topic of the, the title of tonight's talk is uh, a meditation on mood. So the Buddhist practice and approach for dealing with depression. <clears throat> so for tonight's talk, I'll, I'll first introduce depression, this concept, as it's commonly known and presented in, uh, from the perspective of Western psychology, uh, modern psychology. And then I'll talk about it uh, in terms of the Buddhist view, as well as the Buddhist approach of, of really dealing with it. So that's my main direction for tonight's talk. <clears throat> Um, but I also wonder, you know, how many people coming to tonight's talk may actually consider yourselves or people that you know as being depressed or experiencing depression? Yeah. Um, you don't have to answer, but this is just a human experience. Yeah, <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. This is a human experience. Um. And maybe you want to know what to do about it. Or you're not sure where to go for help sometimes. Yeah? Maybe some people are curious. Okay, well, how does Buddhism address it? Maybe you know about the, the modern psychology, modern... <coughs> uh, <clears throat> some modern approaches <clears throat> of psychotherapy. Maybe you're curious about the Buddhist approach. So... Um, hopefully I can address some of your interests and provide information and also methods to deal with, to, with what you're experiencing. Um, but, you know, before even starting the, the topic here, if you do feel depressed to the point where you feel suicidal, you feel like taking your life, and if you actually have a plan and you feel, you feel like you're in a, a crisis situation, it's actually better just to immediately have yourself brought to the hospital. Either bring yourself, or if you're, if you're in a very anxious and kind of feeling very unstable, call someone you know who's close to you, they can bring you. If you feel embarrassed or even ashamed to talk to people you know, you can just call 911 and they'll come have an ambulance come and, and pick you up. And this is the safest thing. <coughs> and I say this because <clears throat> people ex experiencing a very strong or um, severe form of depression may be suicidal. So it's important that you, know, you, you protect yourself, protect your life. That's the most important thing. Um, 
And then when you feel better, you can come back and listen to the talk. Okay. So what is depression? Um, I'm sure we've all heard the word before, but what does it really mean? And what are the symptoms or signs of depression? This is important to know. <coughs> so <clears throat> in modern psychology, um, you know, the general definition of depression is just a mental health issue where a person is experiencing sadness, either mild or severe. And the sadness is often accompanied with a, a lack of interest in anything. This is the kind of most broad, basic idea of depression. And probably not surprising to you. So again, this term covers a broad experience of general sadness or feeling in a, a, a low mood, feeling that nothing is enjoyable. <coughs> <coughs> so depression <clears throat> can be experienced in a very intense and severe form. Like I just mentioned, a person can be depressed we may experience depression to the point of not only thinking about suicide, but then making plans or even attempting it. We can say that's more of a severe experience of depression. And then it can be mild, where this is just a coming and going of, of mood, shifting of mood where <coughs> sometimes the sadness we experience really affects us. Um, more than just a passing thought of, of, or a passing feeling of, oh, did you hear the news? Oh, yeah, I heard that. And we may feel slightly saddened by it. But depression is, is more than that. Even the mild form is, is more than just a passing thought or a very quickly passing feeling. So it's important to distinguish that. <clears throat> when we use the word depression, um, there's some degree of persisting emotion, persisting uh, experience of sadness. <clears throat> but we can also distinguish that persisting sadness that comes from um, a, a sense of loss. Maybe we have lost a person in our lives, um, and we have lost a job. Um, uh, and losing a person, meaning that person may have uh, died, passed away, or maybe it's just a relationship that, that ended. There's a separation, a feeling of loss. <coughs> um, <clears throat> this uh, depression or sadness could also be a, a persisting mood that, that lasts not only days, but weeks. It could even be months, and it could be weeks, and then with a with a kind of break or uh, remission, as it's called, followed by you know a longer period, another few weeks, of this very low, down, uh, depressed mood. <clears throat> when it's severe, when we experience depression to a very severe degree the term clinical depression is used. And when we say clinical depression, that means that our very daily life functioning is, is affected by it greatly. So for example, because of the severity of it, we may not be able to sleep, lose appetite, we're unable to work. Our relationships start to... <coughs> <coughs> We start to have more serious issues with relationships and our usual functioning, our usual way of getting along in daily life is, is interrupted. That's when we call it clinical depression. <clears throat> so what are some signs and symptoms? Uh, and I'm, I'm getting this list of signs and symptoms from 
a manual called the DSM-5, which is a, a manual of modern psychology and uh, psychotherapy that's used internationally to identify different kinds of mental health issues. Sometimes it's called disorders. The book describes them as disorders. They could be just be described as of issues or patterns that affect mental health. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, one first kind of obvious sign is a low mood, feeling very sad. Sometimes feeling sadness to the point of, of feeling hopeless, like there's no way out. Uh, no way out of the feeling or no way out of a, a certain situation. <clears throat> um, we may find ourselves in a life situation that's very challenging and hopelessness. Uh, we may experience a, a very genuine and deep sense of hopelessness when whatever we try just doesn't, doesn't seem to work. Um, so as we can see, it's not just a passing sadness. It can be very deep and um, debilitating. And some people describe this very low state as, as a kind of empty feeling, um, not the emptiness of the, the concept of Buddhism, but empty meaning just lacking, as if we're lacking something. We can't fill the kind of void in our mind, and we just can't seem to um, improve our mood. <clears throat> <coughs> a second, <clears throat> and I'll try to go through the list a bit more quickly and get into more detail later. Um, another symptom is, is a lack of interest in things. The things that we may usually be interested in, or the things we love to do, we may just not have any interest at all. And we don't get any pleasure from doing those things. Um, so this could be a hobby that you like to do. Uh, it could even be you know, being with a person uh, or, or even sensations that you're usually pleasant, whether it's a food you really like or even you know, sexual contact. For someone who's very depressed, even sex, which is you know, we could say one of the most pleasant sensations of a physical experience, a person would have no interest and feel uh, it's not even pleasant if they're having it. Um, another symptom is weight loss or weight gain, significant and, and fast, meaning like say 5% of your body weight in, in a month. <coughs> So five to 10 pounds, you know, in a very short time, that could be a sign of, of depression, either loss or weight gain. Um, losing sleep or wanting to sleep all the time. Some people are depressed, just, just sleep hours and hours to escape the feeling. Some people, because of the depression and other symptoms that kind of go along with it, may not be able to fall asleep. <clears throat> and physically, a person may experience this uh, fidgetiness, like they have to move all the time, tapping their feet or moving their body all the time, kind of very agitated physically. That's another sign. Or it can be the opposite, actually a complete slowing down and retardation of physical movement and even expression and speech. So sometimes people who are severely depressed, their speech becomes very slow and even monotone. <clears throat> Fatigue is another symptom, feeling tired all the time. And then thoughts and thoughts of worthlessness, like thinking that <clears throat> <clears throat> your life isn't worth anything or that we have no value when we're in this very low mood. And our cognitive functions can be affected so that 
even when we try to think and concentrate or make decisions, it becomes very difficult. And our whole cognitive thinking and uh, um, memory becomes faulty or slowed or, or burdensome. And people talk about a kind of brain fogginess as well. <clears throat> and then, as I mentioned, some you know thoughts of uh, thoughts and plans to commit suicide, to take one's life. And sometimes it may just be frequent thinking about dying or thinking about death as a way to escape. And if it's if it's, you know, just a passing thought about dying and death, which, you know, I think it's safe to say everyone will experience time, you know, from uh, experience now and again. But if it's this constant, reoccurrent, uh, very frequent thinking of dying, that's, that's a bit different. It's a bit heavier. And that usually follows with uh, the increasing severity of depression. <clears throat> so, you know, for those who are experiencing this, some of these symptoms or even all of these symptoms, it's important to let you know that, you know, it, it's normal. It's normal and that it's human experience and that no one should feel bad for feeling this. Uh, the opposite, you know, we hope that you feel compassion for yourself and we can be compassionate for those who are experiencing this very heavy, very debilitating, low, uh, depressed mood. <clears throat> it's at these times where we need often the most help and the most support. So it's important that we look at this with a, a compassionate mindset. So what is the cause in terms of Western psychology? You know, well, this is a, such a huge topic. I won't get into much of the the Western psychology and psychotherapy um, sort of approach and understanding of depression. But in general, uh, we look at the causes of mental illness or mental health issues as having you know, three aspects. One is physiological, the body and its functions and its chemistry, nervous system and all these changes, as well as it's the body's relationship to the environment psychological aspect, which is a person's thinking, a person's habits of, of behavior. <clears throat> and then the social aspect, which is patterns that we learn from other people, from the family we grew up in, to the, the society we grew up in, and the many cultures that we, that we uh, associate with. This bio-psycho-social kind of covers these aspects of environment, body, mind, and, and all the social engagement. <clears throat> so there's no, you know, one cause for depression. It's just a, a very individualized, complicated um, experience. So there's, in a way, no one answer from, uh, in terms of my understanding, from the approach of modern psychology and, and psychotherapy. It's always an individualized understanding or individualized approach to uh, helping a person with, with depression. But there's uh, these underlying aspects that we can look at. <clears throat> and then it's treated clinically through, you know, if it's very severe, sometimes medication is important. You know, and maybe you don't hear Buddhist teachers talking about medication much, right? Um, but in crisis situations, medication may be a thing to just keep some <coughs> a person stable <coughs> and help them get through <clears throat> the crisis period. And then and later on, they can receive therapy either individually or in a group. And there are different kinds of therapy in, in modern psychotherapy. There's not just one therapy. Um, and I won't get too much into it, but just a brief few examples that may relate to the Buddhist approach that I'll introduce later. Um, there are therapies that focus on a person's thinking or their 
cognitive therapies that address how we think because our way of thinking affects our feelings and emotions. So if we change our thinking, it will change our emotions and our mood. It's like a basic principle of this cognitive kind of therapy. There's also psychoanalytic therapies where uh, with a therapist, a person can look more deeply at their past experience, at their relationships with people, and through talking about it and exploring more deeply the uh, kind of what's stored in their mind, they can understand their history better and then understand their present behavior better. So maybe by understanding the way they relate to their parents, oh, wow, now they can understand how they relate to other people. And that understanding and even interpretation can help a person then change. So those can be useful. <clears throat> Mindfulness techniques are also used in psychotherapy, but usually with a focus on just being a tool, a tool for calming the mind or a tool for relaxation, kind of coping with the painful experience of, of depression. Oftentimes, mindfulness is, a, is just the, the tool. Um, it's not quite as a comprehensive approach as Buddhist mindfulness, but there, there may be some argument there that may be changing. <clears throat> Other ways to treat depression is exercise. There was a very, very fascinating um, study, uh, or it's, we, could, we can call it a, a meta-analysis, which uh, is a study that looks at previous studies and does a, an overall um, um, analysis or review of previous studies. So there's something called Move Your Mental Health. If you're interested in reading it, it's called Move Your Mental Health, and it's a, a, a review of 30 years of research of how exercise can benefit our mental health. And specifically, it, it even analyzes which ones worked very well for depression. And it so happens that kind of high-intensity cardio, sorry, high-intensity cardio uh, and and even dance, and that kind of activity was very good and very effective for depression. So quite interesting, something you can look into. Move your mental health. <coughs> so with all these different modes of psychotherapy, medication, change of, of lifestyle, this can really help a person not only through crisis, but to work through uh, more chronic and, and long-term depression. Um, sorry, one thing I didn't mention is meaningful activity. Meaningful activity, for example, just doing something could be benefiting other people, like volunteering. Uh, people find that doing this beneficial, wholesome activity um, and, and caring for others can actually bring a, a, a great uh, improvement or lessening of depression. So people can live and function better with all this support, psychotherapy, medicine, and, and wholesome social engagement, and minimize, <coughs> minimize the, the symptoms of depression. <clears throat> So what about the Buddhist view and the Buddhist approach? So as far as I understand and as far as I know, the, ter the term depression you know, does not exist in Buddhist literature. Of course, the, the, you know, the original Buddhist literature was not in English. So of course, it didn't have this word depression. Um, but the term sadness is, of course, used. Sadness in a general way and used specifically depending on the, uh, the, the context 
But when the Buddha talked about the human condition, he talked about sadness um, and used other similar terms to describe this just low, depressed mood. And if we look at just the way Buddhist uh, psychology identifies any kind of human experience of not only sadness or depression, but suffering in general, it's described as um, one part of it is a feeling, a feeling that's experienced in the body, unpleasant feeling. Um, the Chinese is cool. Um, Cool uh, show. So, literally, it's just unpleasant feeling, or it could even be translated as a bitter feeling. <clears throat> and that's uh, not only a bodily sensation in terms of, for example, when we're sick, we have an illness. That's also an unpleasant feeling, but it's an unpleasant feeling which is is driven by our thinking. Our thinking. It's not only just having thoughts, but in the case of sadness or depression, a rumination. The Buddha used an interesting term to describe rumination. He, he uh, or it was translated by someone into English as a constellation of thoughts and thinking. Kind of like constellation of stars in the sky. It's like you see one, but then you see another, and you see another, and then you just see billions and countless stars it's like the uh a constellation or flourishing of thinking <coughs> an elaboration and, and a kind of endless flow of thinking which is dwelling on things um dwelling on the past or dwelling on a future that hasn't arrived. Could be dwelling on the present, something that's happening, but simultaneously we're evaluating it, judging it, and our thoughts and our opinions and our, and our like or dislike towards something flourishes. <clears throat> so this just sadness, as Buddhism describes it very simply, is this condition of an ongoing recycling process of perception and feeling, thought and emotion. And it's ongoing and recycling because, because our mind is attaching. It's not just a thought where you know, we remember something and then based on that memory, we go do something. And then that thought is no longer necessary. But it's an attachment to thoughts, which makes them recycle. And our thinking is this uh, ongoing and potentially endless flow of dwelling or clinging on. On to what? <clears throat> well, we're usually sad about something, right? There's, there's a content to our sadness. What are we sad about? So it could be, as mentioned before, you know, this sadness about loss. Right? Sadness usually comes from a sense of loss, right? A perception that we've lost something. Uh, we've lost someone's life. They've died. Uh, maybe we've lost our own health. If we get an illness, <coughs> <coughs> or maybe we, we think that we failed at something. And usually, if we believe that we truly failed at something, and there's a tendency to really dwell on it and continuously think and ruminate on how we failed, how terrible it was, right? Um, and isn't that interesting? Like, why do we do that? If we know something was a failure, potentially we could understand, oh, okay, that was a mistake, or that was 
that didn't turn out well. So next time, let's do it better. But more often, we sort of dwell on these images and ideas of how we failed or lost. And that can often lead to guilt. A lot of sadness comes sometimes from guilt, feeling that we've not only failed, but we can't redeem ourselves, right? It's an unresolved failure. I failed and it's as if it's ongoing. I failed and I'm still failing. And we can even identify, <coughs> <coughs> we may identify with it <clears throat> to the point of seeing ourself as a failure. I am a failure. And that, that, that way of thinking, ongoing thinking can, can persist. And we feel that we're wrong, right, for that failure. Some people may just feel that even if they, they don't have an experience of a, a kind of terrible failure or loss, they may just feel that they're lacking. Um, so you know, kind of many people that I, I work with, they talk about um, just feeling the sense of lack where they're not good enough. And no matter how hard they try, it just seems that they're, they're, never, they're never good enough. I'm not sure where that comes from, but it's just a persisting idea of their self. Just never good enough. So that brings with it this, this kind of sadness. If we're never good enough, then it's almost like happiness is, is eternally in the future. And we can say that all these kinds of patterns of thinking, which are, we could boil all of them down to the perception of loss, which is a theme uh, that Buddhism identifies a theme of um, human suffering or human vexation is the theme of constantly being engaged in thoughts of gain and loss and how that can um, rule our lives or rule our way of thinking, constantly worrying about gain and loss. When we failed, we dwell on it. When we win, or we succeed. We may also dwell on that. But there's an insecurity there because we know, okay, maybe loss is around the corner again. So we're happy for a few minutes and it may seem like danger is near. <clears throat> so this, this kind of uh, negativity and dwelling on loss uh, what does Buddhism say? You know, what's the cause of that? You know, why do we do that? Why do we torture ourselves, in a sense, by thinking in that way and dwelling on these ideas of loss? Um, the Buddha just said that's, that's ignorance. That's another condition that we find ourselves in. We are ignorant. What does that mean? Again, it doesn't just mean we, we lack knowledge. It's not like we're just lacking knowledge or some kind of intellectual understanding. Ignorance means that we're lacking awareness. We're lacking awareness of what? Awareness of how the mind is working. We even lack awareness that our thinking pattern is so negative and is so kind of trapped in ideas of loss in terms of you know, uh, depression, sadness. <coughs> we may not even notice how much of our day our mind is in that recycling of um, ideas of loss. <clears throat> Sometimes it takes a conversation for someone to point out to us and be like, whoa, hey, you know, that's pretty negative to think in that way. Or they may point out that we're, we're really dwelling on something that 
may have been a, a mistake, but it's actually resolved already, or it can be resolved. Sometimes it takes a conversation or someone else to point it out to us. So uh, that's, that's ignorance, really being unclear about the depth of our suffering and how our mind is creating it. <clears throat> so if we're unaware, we don't even notice what we're thinking. We may not even notice what it even means to dwell on something, to dwell on thoughts. It's just like it becomes our, um, uh, in, in, in my field, the word baseline is used. This is in many different fields, but baseline meaning like our baseline way of, of being is we're often dwelling on something. So we don't even have an experience of what it's like to not dwell on something and to have a mind, a body experience that is lighter, freer, more clear. We, we, we don't have that perspective unless we've started to um, practice, started some means of either uh, we can call it recovery or we can call it practice or training of the mind. So what happens is that our mind is just caught in a process of clinging to its own images and ideas. Sometimes for some people, it's very verbal. So the ideas of loss and the depressing mood may come from a lot of verbal thinking. You know, I'm a failure. This is never going to work out. I'm hopeless. A lot of words. For other people, it may be more imagery, you know, kind of playing a movie within the mind of how life is so stuck and just not working out or replaying the experiences and the images of those unpleasant experiences. Kind of like, you know, when you get to the a part of a movie, which you think is just like the bad part, it's like as if we keep rewinding it and playing it again, even though we don't like it, we rewind it, play it again, rewind it, play it again. It's like torture. <clears throat> the process of the mind clinging to these impressions of the past and imagination of the future, as well as the, the kind of discrimination and judgment about the present, it just makes the mind blurred. It's like there's this constant fog of thinking and emotion. And it makes, it makes our experience of life rigid. You know, if, if, we, uh, if we can describe life as, as flowing, as fluid, right? We all know there's change all the time. Life is fluid. Everything is changing. Our body, the environment, our, our thoughts and feelings, all of it is fluid, right? <clears throat> but when we, we dwell on our thoughts and images, it makes everything seem very rigid and, and permanent. So that, for example, that experience of the past that was the mistake of our life, or maybe the many mistakes of our lives, it's as if we've made it into this permanent thing that's a part of us and that will never go away because we're constantly uh, ruminating, dwelling on it. It makes everything seem rigid and permanent and even makes our sense of self seem permanent. So that's how the idea of, oh, I'm hopeless comes about because our self even feels permanently stuck in the same way that those experiences or failures seem to be um, permanently there. <coughs> so this process of, uh, process of ignorance that the Buddha talks about, it makes us misperceive everything about life and the world. The Buddha's insight about life and the world is that everything is moving. 
everything is flowing and everything is related, nothing exists by itself in a vacuum um, and nothing stays the same. And this is the fluid dynamic nature of life. But when we cling to our thoughts and ideas, everything seems frozen and we feel stuck. And that's how depression can get uh, so strong and so, so deep because our condition of ignorance and this kind of uh, mental blindness doesn't allow us to, to see things as they are, to see their dynamic nature. Um, so just to make that more concrete, for example, you know, something simple in the, the physical world or the natural world, a tree, for example. When we think about a tree, you know, this image of this tree comes to mind, maybe the trunk of the tree, the leaves, and maybe we see some roots on the top of the ground. And since we can't see through the ground, we, we pretty much see the tree as whatever is above the ground, right? Even if we know there's roots there in our mind, we probably just visualize what's above the ground. And it's just this fixed image. And we think a tree is just a tree. It's in a sense by itself. It's living, yeah, it's alive, but it seems very much by itself, independent. But we also all know that a tree cannot exist without you know, the elements of water and light um, the proper climate. And for folks who've studied, you know, kind of uh, uh, biological sciences know that trees and plants have very specific requirements for their survival. Every type of tree has a certain kind of soil that it needs, a certain soil for its roots to spread properly. And, and we're even learning that trees need certain fungi, fun, fungi, or fungi, fungi, <laughs> however you say it, uh, in order for that tree to, to flourish. And of course, even a certain amount of water. Some trees will die with a certain amount, where another tree will flourish with that same amount of water. All the conditions are different for each kind of tree, and it could definitely not exist by itself. Yet, in our mind, the image of it may be quite, quite kind of fixed and rigid. It's just there. <clears throat> what about ourselves? When we think of ourselves, how do we see ourselves? Maybe we often just think of ourselves, our body, or how we feel and our thoughts. And we just think of ourselves as this person there, isolated from everybody else. And in the case of depression, we think of ourselves as being very alone, um, stuck, hopeless, very far and distant from others. But in reality, that's, that's not our self. If we want to talk about what is our true self, Buddhism says that our true, true self is a changing self and is a self in relation to others. So in the same way that a tree requires all those conditions, our self also flourishes in certain conditions or may, um, um, what's the word for when a tree dries up? A certain word for that, it's escaping me. A tree, it doesn't crumble. Chinese is ku diao le. I can't remember the English, but I think you know the word. Um, a tree will die. So this is what the Buddha means uh, in terms of what is the true kind of reality of our situation. It's fluid, it's changing, and it's constantly in relationship with other things, being nourished by them or not being nourished by them. So depression uh, is ignorance. 
It's our mind dwelling on a wrong idea of ourself, a very inaccurate abstraction of ourself and of, of the world. So from the Buddhist perspective, depression is not something, some thing, like just some something inside of us that we have or that was given to us. It wasn't given to us from the outside. Um, so we can't blame so-called external conditions. We can't blame society, but we, we can't say that we're completely separate from society. We can't say that society, our family doesn't affect us because it does. We learn and absorb from uh, our family, from our social environment. But still Buddhism emphasizes that we have the choice or if we have the awareness of how our mind is working, we can choose um, how we respond and we can choose how we relate to you know, the challenges of life. So Buddhism recognizes relationships, social relationships, uh, and, and these what's called causes and conditions of the way we are. But Buddhism also empowers us and reminds us that we can, although we may feel terribly stuck in depression or some other um, experience of, of dis-ease, we have the potential to be free from it. Um, there was a story I, I wanted to share. Uh, there was a story from the the Buddhist um, the Buddha's discourses where there was a woman um, who her only child had passed away, and she was terribly upset. You, know, you can imagine. Her only child had passed away. She was uh, deeply saddened and upset. And she wanted the Buddha to bring him back to life. You know, she thought the Buddha could, you know, had special powers. She heard he had these powers. So she says, can you bring my son back to life? And the Buddha said, I can bring your son back to life if you can find this mustard seeds. Uh, from every house where there was never a death in the family. When you bring me these mustard seeds, then I can bring your child back to life. So she, she had a sense of hope in her, and she went from house to house asking, you know, has anyone not passed away in this house? I just need mustard seeds. If I get this seed, my child will be brought back to life. She went house to house but there wasn't one house that gave her mustard seeds because there wasn't even one house that didn't experience death, that didn't experience this kind of loss. <coughs> um, eventually she had uh, an insight in just to the natural way of things that death doesn't necessarily have to be seen as a loss, but just the, uh, the physical death of the body is a, a natural thing that every person has to face. So we could say, is it a loss or is it not a loss? It depends. If for us, we uh, dwell on it, constantly ruminate on how we've lost someone or something well for us it's a loss if we accept the reality of this dynamic nature of life is it really a loss has something totally gone and disappeared well we may have a, a certain insight that we don't see it as a loss we're freed from that, that rumination and the sadness brought about by dwelling on a 
idea of loss. There was also another story um, where it, uh, it was about war. I thought of bringing this up just because of what's happening in the world, uh, Russia, Ukraine, and not only there. I mean, there, there are many wars happening all over the globe. Some of them we just don't know about. We don't hear about. But there are wars happening in many places, which is a you know, terrible amount of suffering for those closely involved and for everyone. And in the, the Buddhist uh, um, texts, there are some instances where the Buddha was able to prevent war by diplomacy. There were these warring clans, and this was in the uh, history of India, you know, 2,500 or 600 years ago. There were many different clans and, and warring groups, and the Buddha had some good relationships with many of them, and through diplomacy, he was able to stop some terrible battles and stop an ensuing war. <coughs> And this takes a lot of, I could say, a lot of courage to involve ourselves in this kind of diplomacy. And we know the Buddha was someone with a kind of unshakable mental stability and compassion. So he just did it, you know, as we see, naturally. But there was also occasions where he wasn't able to prevent it. And as the story goes... Uh, and it's a very long and detailed story, just the, the kind of general summary of the story was that <clears throat> the Buddha heard that there was a, 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 a prince of a certain clan who had a lot of issues with his own clan. The Buddha was born in, in the Shakya clan as a prince, and so he still had connections with his people, and he would visit and teach, and there was another a clan in a neighboring area who had a long kind of history of complicated, bad political relations, all sorts of complicated stuff. And this prince of the other clan, sorry, I can't remember the name, had this vengeance, wanted to get revenge on the Buddha's Shakya clan. When the Buddha heard about this happening, that this prince was bringing his whole army to go in and to attack the Shakyans. The Buddha tried to intervene and he, he waited by a tree kind of in the path of this, of this uh, army. And for the first, the first time, the Buddha was able to convince the prince to turn around, he convinced him that it wasn't worth it, the bloodshed, the hardship, it wasn't worth it. Twice, uh, the prince returned. And I believe it was the third time the Buddha was successful in kind of turning them back, convincing them. But actually, the fourth, <coughs> <coughs> the fourth time, by that time, that prince was so venge vengeful, so full of rage and vengeance that he didn't turn around. And they eventually went to attack and um, slaughter the Shakya clan. It was a terrible kind of situation. But the Buddha knew that even his diplomacy couldn't stop what was going to happen. And he being one person could not stop an army. <clears throat> um, I think it's a kind of a, a sad ending to a story in a way. You know, it still ended with a tragedy. But what we see in that story is also that the Buddha tried his best compassionately to prevent harm, to prevent tragedy. But he also knew at some point that after doing his best, that was all that could be done. Um, did he then dwell on it? Did he think of himself as a failure? Or the Buddha, having failed even protecting his own people. Um, 
Well, in terms of Buddhist philosophy, the Buddha is someone who is enlightened, completely enlightened, free from uh, suffering, free from depression in this context, free from thoughts of failure. Uh, so we can say, no, he didn't. Or would it be wise to think of himself as a failure? Is that a, an awakened way of looking at life? <clears throat> so just in the context of, you know, all of the tragedy and conflict we face in our modern world, I think these stories can show us that we can do as much as we can. And, and we should be active in trying to promote peace, prevent conflict, use diplomacy. But when things just don't seem to work out and when peace does not prevail for the time being, we need to remember that um, dwelling on it as, as a failure or even dwelling on the ideas of tragedy it actually doesn't help the situation. Although it's normal to feel sad, we're ordinary people, to feel sadness, to feel fear, to feel anxiety. With our practice, we can recognize those that, that kind of ignorance. We could recognize the workings of our mind and choose not to put our energy into ruminating on how terrible things are. We don't need to put energy into clinging to the idea of failure and of catastrophe. We can see the reality of things, see clearly, but also see that it's dynamic and it's conditioned. So there's constant possibility for uh, redirecting harm and bringing about peace. And if we make mistakes along the way, there's also possibility for you know, wiser diplomacy, you know, whether it's a, an international level or just an interpersonal level. We always have opportunities for a change of strategy, wiser diplomacy, compassionate uh, interaction. I think this is the message that uh, Buddhism, that the Buddha is, um, is, is presenting to us, that depression and sadness, although it happens, with practice, we can transform it and have energy to engage in a compassionate way, in a, a skillful way. <clears throat> so to, to use a phrase to summarize this, in Buddhism, it says, Everything is created by the mind. Uh, another, another way to phrase that is our experience of life depends on our mind. No matter what conditions we face, if we practice, if we have awareness of our mind and how it's working, we can create, so to speak, stability of mind. And then we can create clarity. Um, create may not be the best word. Because in terms of Buddhism, the true kind of peace, a true clarity, stability of mind is uncreated. It's not made by something. So maybe to describe it more accurately, if we stop creating sadness, stop perpetuating and creating depression, then what we reveal is our natural capacity for stability, our natural capacity for wisdom, uh, which is also compassion, right? So the creation of depression is up to us. The creation of any other kind of vexation, anger, craving. It's up to us. <clears throat> so Buddhism, in terms of dealing with depression, we try to get to the root. 
we use different practices such as meditation, mindful living in general, being mindfully aware of sitting, standing, walking, talking, what we watch, what we ingest. We can also practice being mindful about that, choosing to ingest what is more wholesome and healthy, choosing not to ingest what feeds the negativity. That's all developing awareness of how our mind is working moment by moment through the day. So through training in mindfulness as a way of living, we can understand deeply our ignorance and uproot it. And this is the Buddhist approach. I'm going to be just mindful of time. I'll say that much about how Buddhism deals with depression. Um, and in terms of the Chan approach, the Chan Buddhist unique approach to depression, it's, it's just letting go of the ideas that create depression. Seeing what we're doing with our mind, seeing what's creating it and dropping it. We reveal our, our nature of stability and clarity, our so-called Buddha or wakeful nature. So if you want to know more about how Buddhism deals with it and you want to practice it, well, that's what retreat is for. So welcome uh, you folks to join retreats and to practice and uh, not just listen and understand, but to engage in the practice. And as far as what I mentioned earlier with the uh, modern psychotherapy, medicine, those things can be helpful as well. And I think they can be used in tandem with Buddhist practice to help uh, ourselves and others when we are really feel very stuck in a deep depression or persistent depression. Uh, maybe we need a little bit of both worlds. Maybe that's something which uh, can help us get unstuck and experience some freedom, experience some uh, clarity. So I'll finish here with the, the talk and let's have some time for some interaction. So let me see here. We can open up uh, the texting. So for our tech person, uh, Kyla, 